Hello. In this video, we're going to go over um, the randomized controlled trials that is covered in Chapter 4 of your textbook. Um, chapter 4 has a lot of information about um, the randomized controlled trials, and um, this video is not going to go into as much detail. It's just going to summarize some of the concepts that were discussed. So please make sure you read that chapter and, and reread it if you need to. So randomized controlled trials can be considered the gold standard for evidence-based medicine. These are usually required um, to show efficacy of a new drug treatment um, during a phase three drug trial, and it's required by the FDA to approve a drug for a new indication or to approve a new drug application. Randomized controlled trials usually have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria for participants. And they're very different from real world settings in that they happen in, usually in very specialized settings or research clinics um, where the research staff can control the variables or the environment that the patient is exposed to. There are um, one big concern in a randomized control trial is the validity of the trial, and there are two types of validity that we're concerned with. The first is internal validity. And these are some examples of things that can threaten internal validity. And I'm not going to go into what each of these mean, but you can go to the book and re read about them. But you've got things like selection of subjects, history, maturation effects, mortality attrition, testing, instrumentation, and statistical regression. Um, I will say that a lot of the ways to try to minimize biases that might occur because of these and to try to um, improve internal validity has to do with including a control group, randomizing participants to groups. Okay, so the idea of statistical regression is sometimes hard for um, students to understand and you might hear this called regression to the mean. So I'm going to give you an example. So if we take a hypothetical example of a thousand individuals of a similar age who were examined and scored on risk of experiencing a heart attack, and we take the top 50 who were rated the greatest risk and measure the success of an intervention, like a new drug, even if the intervention is worthless, the test group would be expected to show an improvement on their next physical exam because of regression to the mean. Because they were so higher at increased risk that they aren't really representative of the whole 1,000 individuals. So how do we kind of combat this? Well, we might not just focus on those top 50. We might try to pick a random sample from the 1,000. But let's say it, it really will only apply to this, this type of group at high risk. Then what we would do is we'd randomly assign people in that, in that group to the intervention and then into a control condition. External validity has to do with how generalizable are your res the study results to the actual population and the clinical population this in, uh, treatment would be used in. And so there's a variety of things that need to be considered and things that could affect this external validity. And again, you can go to the textbook to read specifically about these things. But they have to mainly do with interactions with treatment. So subject, subject selection, pre-testing, setting, history, and then this idea of multiple treatments. There are, I mentioned, uh, several different types of biases that could occur. Um, and these, again, are discussed in more depth in your textbook. But there are different ways to try to minimize these different types of biases. So the investigation or investigator, the selection, performance, attrition, and detection. So some ways um, to minimize bias in a study is to keep those collecting the data and assessing the data blind to what condition the participants in. Make sure that you're randomly selecting um, participants from the target population and randomly assigning them to the different treatment groups or control groups. Um, making sure that um, any measurements that you take, so um, blood pressure or um, heart rate, that you are conducting that test for that outcome the same way every time you do it for every subject. So I mentioned that um, one really key part of a randomized controlled trial is randomization. So this is one way to try to balance 
um, basically baseline characteristics of your study sample between the, diff between the groups that you have. And so there's many different strategies to do this. And the most basic one is simple randomization. And in simple randomization, you're basically just flipping a coin and saying, okay, participant one, you are heads, you go to group A. Okay, participant two, oh, your heads, go to group A. Participant three, oh, your tails, go to group B, and so forth. Um, this is, again, very simple and straightforward, but uh, downsides are that you might not have a nice balance of baseline characteristics between the two groups because it's purely random. So you might have like a lot of men in one group and very few in the other groups, or a lot of people of one age range in one group versus another. So what else can we do? Well, we could do a block design. So it's a little bit better than just simple randomization. So we could do block randomization. If we have two um, groups, we've got a control group and a treatment group, what we might say is, okay, I'm gonna create like a little block that has four people. So the first four people that I get, um, I'm gonna assign in, um, to the control and treatment group in the way that I have the block uh, outlined. So for instance, you create blocks. Here we've done, they've assigned four people per block. You can make it two people, you can make it six, a variety of different ways you can do it. Four is pretty good here. So you can see that I've created blocks, six different blocks that have different orders of my randomization. So if I say these, the, these black ones are for the treatment group and white is the control, if I had block one, the first four participants would go treatment, treatment, control, control. Whereas in block two, those four participants would go treatment, control, treatment, control. So there's still a little bit of randomization. So what happens when I have all six of these? Well, I start randomly um, picking these blocks until I have an assignment of all of my participants. And this makes sure that there's a balance between the two groups. Uh, but the baseline characteristics might still not be balanced, but at least the number will be. So this type of randomization is called stratified randomization, and this tries to help control the issue of a balance in baseline characteristics. So um, here I've got my population sample, or my sample, my study sample, purple and green faces. And so I stratify them on some sort of variable that I'd like to balance. So I'd like to balance my green faces with my purple faces. It could be males versus females. It could be young versus old. And then within these stratified groups, I then now randomize them to the control and experimental groups. So that in the end, I am, end up with an equal number of uh, green faces and purple faces in the control and an equal number of green and purple in the experimental groups. Adaptive randomization is a little bit um, different, but basically um, what happens is you start off with people being um, an equal randomization, 50-50 um, chance of being assigned to treatment group A or group B. And as you start randomizing people to it, so kind of like the simple randomization, I'm flipping my coin, if I get like three people in a row that all get A, now I've got a, an uneven number of people. So what I do is I alter the probability that somebody will get um, assigned to group A and group B. So for instance, I've got three people assigned to group A, the next person, and I've got nobody in B. Then I shift my uh, percentage to be 25% likely to get an A, but 75% in B. And so here I'm still leaving some sort of probability and, and chance, but I've kind of changed it to try to favor the group that is, has the lower number, for instance. So you can see where this might get, kind of get a little fuzzy on whether this is actual true randomization or not. Um, I mentioned blinding as one way to help with biases. So, um, there are different types of blinding that can happen in a trial. Um, and the, the sing so for instance, a single blinded trial means that the patient doesn't know which treatment condition they've been randomized to. 
but the investigator, the statistician, people doing the data collection and data analysis are not blind and they know. A double blind trial is one that you might come across the most. And this is where the people collecting the data, so the investigators and the patient, are both blinded to what treatment condition the patient is receiving. But in this case, the data, the st statistician or the people doing the data analysis aren't blinded. And then kind of the best scenario would be a triple blind. So here, the patient, the people collecting the data, and the people analyzing the data, they're all blinded to the condition. You obviously still need to have like a, another person, like maybe an investigational um, pharmacist who's not having any other interaction with the patients or the data collection or data analysis be the one that maintains you know, who received what and they stay unblinded. Very rarely will you ever come across an RCT that is open label. Usually open label studies where nobody's blinded, patients know what they're getting, are um, really limited to phase one drug trials where your outcomes are objective measures. So these have to do with pharmacokinetic or safety outcomes and not um, objective, uh, subjective measures. Sample size is really important to determine at the beginning prior to running your RCT. And the sample size is really important. Um, RCTs take a long time and cost a lot of money to run. So you can't just run, you know, a huge number of people through your study realis you know, realistically because it might cost a lot of money and it might take a really long time. So you need to kind of try to optimize your sample size. One um, downside of many RCTs is that they are underpowered and this means that they tend to have too small of a sample size to detect a true effect. And so sample size is calculated based on effect size and power. And we will cover these in more detail later in the semester, but briefly, effect size is the magnitude of an effect. So it's um, how large of an effect due to treatment um, do you get compared to the um, control group, or is the degree of difference between the treatment groups, the treatment and control group clinically significant? Um, power measures the capacity to detect a difference in the study groups if a true difference exists. So you need, so a lot of the times with studies being underpowered, they fail to find a difference that really does exist because there's too small of a sample. But so you would increase your sample size, but again, you can't just increase it to infinity because it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. So you need to find the, the ideal number that's going to maximize on effect size and power. So um, every randomized controlled trial, uh, at least it should, ha has a research protocol. It's kind of a how-to handbook for everybody involved in, the, in running the trial. Um, so anybody collecting data, analyzing data, enrolling subjects, anything. And it's going to have a lot of detailed information. There's a really nice outline of the different headings that are included in a research protocol in your textbook. But um, broadly, they're going to include things like the target population, the study sample, including the inclusion and exclusion criteria, a plan for recruitment of participants, selection of a control group. So are you going to use a placebo? Are you going to use an active control like uh, standard of care um, or historical control? Most RCTs are superiority trials that you'll come across. So they're trying to test if an experimental intervention or drug or treatment is better than a placebo or an active comparator or something. There are non-inferiority trials, and these are trials where you're just trying to determine if there's equivalence between the two treatments. And these are usually the case when it's not ethical to give a group a placebo. So you would give them maybe an active control, and you're really just trying to see, is this new treatment um, any worse? than the standard of care. Um, different types of study designs um, can be used for randomized controlled trials, and um, they all have pros and cons to them. So one general, you know, one that you might come across are these parallel groups. So here you have your study population. You randomly assign them to a treatment and a control group. And 
then you measure, you know, whatever your outcomes are, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, pain ratings, depending on what the, the purpose is of the study, and you follow them up, and then you compare the results between the treatment and control groups. Oh, did this pain medication reduce pain in the treatment group compared to uh, placebo in the control group? Um, and during this process, you might, um, while you're running the trial, you might start comparing results between the groups prior to completion of data collection, because, and this is called an interim analysis, because you want to ensure that um, you're not putting the participants in increased risk from taking the experimental medication or participating in the drug. And so those things like interim analysis, uh, analyses need to be defined ahead of time and need to be and should be conducted by um, kind of a outside body, like so another person that's not collecting the data as well and, and is blind to the conditions. Another type of study design is a crossover design and this is um, nice because you can have include a much smaller sample size in this type of study design than in a parallel design and the reason for that is that any everybody in this study receives both drug conditions, whereas in the other you need to power it so you have a large enough group receiving one drug condition versus a separate group of subjects receiving another. So this is considered a within subjects type design. So here, people assigned to group one receive drug A first, whereas people in group two receive drug B first. Then after um, they've received the tr completed the treatment, there's a washout period. This could be a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months. And then the groups switch which drug they receive. So now those that got B get A, those that got A got B. And you can compare the effectiveness of A and B, A to B, in the same subject. Um, downside of this, even though you can have small sample size, is that it can take a long time to conduct because of washout, and then you might also have carry over effects from you know whatever they received the first time um, affecting the second uh, drug treatment that they receive. Another kind is a factorial design, and so this factorial design is basically um, you have many different factors you're testing. So for instance, instead of just testing um, whether drug A is better than drug B. So we randomize our group to drug A to drug B, but we have two doses of those drugs within these groups. So we've got dose one and dose two. So really what we're doing is we're interested in drug type, which is one factor, and then dosage of drug as a second factor. So we end up with actually four groups of subjects. You can add more factors to that and keep dividing it out, but know that as you add more factors, you need to increase your overall sample size because as you know, 10 people that you start off here and you divide in half, you get five and five. If you try to divide that again, you now end up with smaller number in each of these groups. And then uh, cluster randomization or group randomization is pretty much basically you have a group of people, you've got different groups of people, and you're assigning that entire group to an intervention rather than just an individual person. Um, an adaptive study design means that depending on how the trial's going or the outcomes of the trial or the interim analysis, um, you might have to adapt how you're conducting the study or how you're randomizing people to groups. Okay, so you might start off with a trial, and um, you've got <coughs> experimental drug versus control drug. At first, you start off with equal randomization, okay? One person goes to one group, the other to the other group, okay? As the trial's going on, you're doing your interim analysis, and you might have defined ahead of time potential stopping rules. For instance, if we get an effect size that is this big showing drug it, the experimental drug is better than the control, there's no need to keep enrolling more people. We've reached our positive efficacy result. Or um, a rule that says, if I get a particular number of adverse events or a percent, particular percentage of people that drop out or experience adverse events, we're going to stop the study because people are now being put at increased risk. So as you're going through the trial, you're constantly looking at your stopping rules. And you're saying, okay, have I met either of my stopping rules? If 
um, it, if it's no, so then you go terminate the trial. Okay, no, I didn't meet my stopping rules, so no, okay. Then the question is, all right, have I reached my sample size, my proposed sample size? Remember, we set that ahead of time. Do I still have more people I can randomize, or did I have I maxed out? If you haven't exhausted your sample size and you go no, you say, okay, let's randomize the next person, and so forth. Until you get to basically, okay, apply stopping rules. Am I going to terminate the trial because of one of these stopping rules? Yes, and trial. Okay, terminate trial because of a stopping rule? No. But let's say I've exhausted my sample size. Well, it adding more subjects, if I've adequately powered my study, adding more subjects shouldn't increase the likelihood of detecting a true effect and would be unnecessary um, cost and time, uh, waste of time to continue the trial, so you might end there. So it's a little bit more complicated, but it's basically like more of a flexible sort of study design. There are things that are important about the study interventions that we need to consider. So effectiveness versus efficacy, this is covered in the textbook. But efficacy is basically how effective is the drug in the randomized control trial. So in the participants that you have recruited and randomized, how, um, how does that experimental drug or treatment affect the outcome? And I'm referring to drug in a lot of these examples since um, you know, you're a pharmacist and you're going to be dealing a lot with study medications. But this is true for even behavioral interventions and other things as well. Effectiveness has to do with outside of the trial. So let's say we show efficacy on our outcome of interest in our trial of a drug. Now we take it out in the market and we start using it in our practice site. How effective in the actual population is this drug? Some other things to consider are safety and adherence. So this has to also do with um, adverse events, uh, dropout, why are people not adhering if they aren't? What are the reasons for that? Um, is it so complicated, the study procedures, that this can't be realistically applied to the clinic? Um, and there's a variety of measures that we collect. So we can look at change from baseline. So is there a change, an effect of the treatment from baseline? Um, process measurements have to do with basically the procedures. So did we follow our protocol? Were there any violations of our protocol? Did we document that? Were there any adverse events? Did we report those? Did we document them? Then you have your outcome measurements. And usually you have one primary outcome measure that your hypothesis testing is based on. And then you can have secondary biomarkers and then obviously safety outcome measures as well. When do you analyze? Well, there's a couple different ways. You could wait until you've collected all of your data, but we talked about how that might not be a good idea in case, um, because trials can be very costly and time consuming, that it might not be the most efficient way to try to determine if a drug has, uh, is effect, uh, has efficacy or is um, putting people at increased risk. So we might try to do some these interim analyses. So this is an example of 250 patients that are enrolled in a randomized controlled trial. 126 were assigned antiplatelets and 124 assigned to anticoagulants. <clears throat> and um, you know, those same numbers received those treatments. And so the intention to treat analysis basically is we are gonna include all participants that we intend to treat from the beginning in our final analysis regardless if they complete or not. So I'm gonna include 126 in this group and 124 in this group. So you're taking into consideration dropouts and that information as well in your efficacy. A per protocol analysis is, I'm only gonna analyze those people that fully complete all protocol steps. So here we had some people in each group that dropped out or weren't included for a variety of reasons. So the numbers that were actually included in the per protocol analyses are much lower. And so um, there are pros and cons to both of these, but it is, if you, obviously, if you only do per protocol, you're missing, you're not including those that might not have completed the study. And the reasons for that can be very important. Subgroup analysis has to do with, okay, so I'm, con I'm most interested in antiplatelets versus anticoagulants. But, so that's my primary con comparison. But let's say I've got males and females that I think that there's a gender effect, depending on the type of treatment. 
I've got equal number of males and females in each of the treatment groups. So within the treatment group, I compare males and females on antiplatelets to each other, and males and females on anticoagulants. That's a subgroup analysis. Um, there are a couple different um, analytical approaches that you can take to this, which will go more into the statistics the second half of the course, but these are some terms and some um, things that you should be familiar with right now. And you can refer back to the textbook for these examples because I'm using the values from the textbook. So the first one is relative risk. This value is the ratio between risk or rate of the outcome in the treatment and control groups. So what's the relative risk of the treatment, of taking the treatment versus not taking the treatment. And so the way it's calculated here is um, in this example, and this is from the textbook, we're going to look at the outcome in the treated group, the likelihood of it, and the likelihood in the outcome in the control group. And so here if we plug in our numbers and we do 0.36 divided by 0.2, our relative risk is 3. Another value that's important is the risk difference, also known as the absolute risk reduction. So it's the change in risk of an outcome of a given treatment in relation to the control. So you can see here with the risk difference you're doing um, within the treatment group, you're basically doing how many in the treatment group had this had controlled hypertension, for instance, divided by the, num the total number in the treatment group minus the number in the control group that had um, controlled hypertension divided by the total number in the control group. And so if we plug in our numbers there, our risk difference is 0.24. And then lastly, another um, piece of information that's important to look at and, and um, review is the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. And they're calculated very similarly. So the number needed to treat is the number you need to treat for one patient to experience the desired outcome. Um, it would be ideal to have a lower number here because basically if you say, I need to treat like 100 people before one person benefits from this treatment, um, is that that's not as good as if I say, I need to treat you know two people for one person to have a benefit. Um, the reverse is the number needed to harm. So number you need to treat for one patient to experience an adverse outcome. So here, a higher number would be better. You would have like, I would need to treat 100 people before one person experiences an adverse outcome versus I would only need to treat two people before somebody experiences something bad. And the way this is calculated for the number needed to treat is the one, it's the inverse of the risk difference or the absolute risk reduction. So in our example, this would be 4.16. So um, you would need to treat uh, four people for one person to experience the desired outcome is how you would interpret. So there are many different strengths and weaknesses of uh, randomized controlled trials. So some strengths, the unbiased evaluation, internal validity, tight control of variables in the controlled setting. But some of these strengths can also be types of weak weaknesses as well. So because it's so uh, controlled and you're including a very specific group of people with inclusion and exclusion criteria, does this really extrapolate to the real world setting and does this benefit the population at large? Um, expertise is required to carry out a randomized controlled trial. It requires a lot of people with a lot of different skills, especially with medical trials, um, having the people with the appropriate medical training on staff. And then the Hawthorne type learning. So the fact that people are a part of a research study might alter the way that they behave and so it might not actually extrapolate very well. In summary, well-designed and rigorously conducted RCTs provide critical information that can significantly impact the clinical practice of medicine and FDA drug approvals. RTCs, RCTs can accurately determine the efficacy of a new drug or intervention using different randomization schemes, active or placebo control groups, recruitment strategies, and data analysis approaches. An understanding of this type of clinical design and the issues are useful for pharmacy practitioners as they take part in clinical research. It's also important to evaluate all aspects of the design of a trial as you interpret the results of published research and consider the applicability of the study findings to your practice setting and to your patients.